Hello everyone, my name is Lori Dyson, and I would like to tell you a little bit about the Exascale Computing Project, which is a large Department of Energy project that's been going on since 2016 to develop a, a capable uh, computing ecosystem for this country's first generation of Exascale computers. So Exascale Computing will provide the next leap forward in computing. The computers that were around at the beginning of the project in 2016 and that are available today are in the petascale class category. That means they can run 10 to the 15th uh, computing floating point operations per second. Exascale computing will be a factor of 1,000 more than petascale computing or a quintillion uh, operations per second, 10 to the 18th. This will allow us in the Department of Energy to really solve problems that were previously intractable for US for scientists. And I believe that the impact on the American people and on the world will be profound. Some of the applications that we're looking at here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab include materials discovery, drug design, an evaluation of seismic hazards uh, and looking at risk assessment, looking at the conversion of plants into biofuels. So large scale national problems that can really be impacted by computing at that next level. We currently here at Livermore have a pre-exascale machine called Sierra, and that runs at a peak performance of 125 petaflops per second. And so the machines that we'll be getting in the 2022-2023 timeframe, that first generation of exascale machines, will be a factor of seven to 10 times more powerful than the machines that we have on the floor today. So the Exascale Computing Initiative is the larger scale within which the Exascale Computing Project fits. So there are three primary components to the broader Exascale Computing Initiative. The first is the Exascale Computing Project, which I'll be talking about in more detail over the next several slides. This is a very large effort within the Department of Energy. It started in 2016 and is expected to complete in 2023. And it's about $1.8 billion. It spans six DOE labs in terms of the management of the project, but involves researchers at most of the 17 DOE labs, as well as over 30 universities. Overall, we have 80 different research teams that are working as part of the Exascale Computing Project and about 1,000 researchers who are working towards creating uh, the vision that I'll describe in a moment. So in addition to the Exascale Computing Project, which is primarily focused on applications and software technologies, there's the actual procurement and delivery of the systems, and those are being handled by the facilities. Uh, one is at Argonne, the ALCF, and that system will be deployed in 2022-23, and that's Aurora. Uh, there's the Frontier system at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and the El Capitan system, which will be sited here at Lawrence Livermore and will be the third of the three systems that are delivered. So in addition to those two primary components for the Exascale Computing Initiative, there's also activities that are happening within the domain science offices of the Department of Energy and the Applied Energy offices as well that are focused on developing applications and software that will be able to leverage the DOE Exascale computers in addition to the work that we have going on within the Exascale computing project. So what we will be doing in the Exascale computing project is delivering on the research and the computer hardware and also the software that's needed to make those machines really useful on day one. So when they are delivered and deployed to, to the three facilities that I just mentioned, we want them to be able to run a variety of mission applications using the DOE software stack and be able to deliver science on, on that first day. So our mission is to really provide exascale ready applications to create a integrated software stack of DOE software technologies and to deliver uh, vendor technologies that will be impactful to the, to the exascale computing systems. So I want to take a minute and just talk a little bit about what we mean by exascale computing. So in many cases, when we're talking about the largest scale systems that are deployed, we talk about peak performance. I just mentioned that for Sierra, our peak performance is 125 petaflops uh, floating point operations per second. But that theoretical peak is something that is not readily achievable by most applications. 
In many cases, we run benchmarks, such as LINPAC, which is a large-scale linear algebra problem, which can achieve near the peak performance, but then real applications, because they are so much more complex in the kinds of operations they do, the order of operations, uh, they have a more challenging time meeting that, that benchmark type number. So what we're looking for is uh, our definition of achieving success at exascale is we want our applications to run 50 times faster than they did on the machines that were available at the beginning of this project. So for example, uh, if we have a computational fluid dynamics uh, application that could run at four petaflops on the machines available in 2016, we'll want them to be able to run at uh, 200 petaflops on an exascale class system. So that 50x improvement, which will translate into 50 times more science that, that we can get done, is what we are going to define success in the exascale computing project. So there are many reasons why high performance computing is challenging to do and why it's getting harder. So when we talk about peak performance of the machine, we're talking about the number of floating point operations that it can do per second. But that's only going to be as good as the amount of data that you can get from the memory in the CPU and in our case the accelerator or GPUs onto those compute chips. And so that memory bandwidth is increasingly becoming further and further uh, imbalanced from the floating point operations. And so we need to think about ways to keep those CPUs busy once they have the data in their cache. And so that's one of the main uh, challenges for scientists today is to increase what we call arithmetic intensity to ensure that those CPUs and GPUs can, can stay busy once the data is there. So moving data is very expensive relative to the computation. Uh, we need to take advantage of different kinds of architectures. For a long time, we were very lucky. We had bulk synchronous uh, applications and architectures that were very uniform. Lots and lots of chips, but they were very much homogeneous. Now we are finding that the way we get additional performance from computers is by having a heterogeneous architecture where we have a mix of CPU units with graphical processing units, uh, GPUs. And now we're, we are in an era where those GPUs are expanding in terms of their diversity as well. So not only do application scientists have to plan for CPU plus GPU accelerated architectures, they have to do it for different kinds of CPUs and different kinds of GPUs. And so that's requiring that we take a look at our software engineering practices and ensure that we have performance portability across a wide variety of architectures. And so that's another challenge for our application and software development development teams is that they need to provide mechanisms and a separation of concerns between their algorithms, their discretizations, their mathematics, and the architecture specific details that they need to, to leverage in order for those codes to run fast. In order to achieve that, we're seeing a number of new programming models. One of the ones that's being developed here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab is Raja, and this is particularly targeted at C++ applications and loop iterations and ensuring that those can achieve performance portability across a wide range of architectures without changing the main kernel of the code. And so that's ma making it easier for application scientists to experiment with different architectures and to get performance on a wider variety of platforms. So the Exascale Computing Project, in order to achieve our vision, is investing in three technical areas to meet the challenges for exascale computing. So we have a very aggressive research and development project. As I mentioned, we started in 2016, investing in applications across the DOE mission space. So there are 24 applications, including three that are focused on national security uh, areas that are striving to achieve that next generation of performance a factor of 50x or broadening the mission capability for applications in areas such as energy, earth science, economic competitiveness, uh, materials, and data science. So a wide variety of application areas that span the DOE, DOE uh, science domains as well as the applied energy offices. Supporting that is our software technology stack which is looking, again, at a number of libraries that have been invested in by the Department of Energy for many years, math libraries such as linear algebra solvers, uh, fast Fourier transform type techniques, 
uh, programming models, debugging tools, things that allow users to be more productive as they come onto these new systems. And one of the main goals here is to ease the burden uh, by which we are able to deploy this broad array of software technologies on exascale computing platforms and also ease the burden by which application teams can take advantage of that software. It's often very time consuming to try and build an application that depends on five or ten different software libraries because you have mismatched versioning or different compilers or just a wide variety of things that can take a lot of time but not be useful for the scientific endeavor. So one of the things that we are doing within the ECP is looking at de deploying a turnkey suite of software tools, which we're calling the extreme scale scientific software stack. So that's a, a activity which is bringing together all 70 of the different software packages, testing them together so that when an application needs to use one, he'll know that there are compatible versions that are available to him on the machine if there are other libraries in that software stack that he also needs to leverage. And then our final area is the hardware and integration area. Because we are not responsible for deploying the exascale systems, we have a large activity within ECP that allows us to uh, integrate and collaborate closely with our facility partners at Argonne, Oak Ridge, and uh, Berkeley, as well as the three NNSA labs. So one of the primary elements of our hardware and integration area is the Path Forward program. This is a program by which we funded US vendors, we funded six different companies to look at advanced research concepts in architecture design. So this was started in 2016 and is completing in 2020. And from that, there are several technologies uh, that were a part of that program that will find their way into the exascale computing platforms that will be deployed in 2021, 22, and 23. In addition, this effort is focused on helping our application scientists and our software technology development specialists have access to the pre-exascale systems that are available now, the early access and the test and development systems that are coming online in the near future in 2020 and 2021, so that we're ready for the exascale machines when they're deployed in 2022. So Livermore has been a critical partner in the exascale computing project. We're very actively involved in the leadership of the project. So I'm the project's deputy director. We have a deputy lead role in the applications development area. That's Eric Drager. Bronisty Sapinski has been in charge of all of the path forward contracts that I just mentioned. And in addition to those leadership roles, Livermore has been very active in all of the focus areas in terms of the technical work that we're contributing to the project. So in the application space, we certainly have applications that are focused on stockpile stewardship science and creating the next generation codes that, that are necessary to move those programs forward. But we're also working in a wide variety of science areas, including subsurface modeling, climate modeling, additive manufacturing, uh, seismic risk assessment, all things that are very important for the NNSA mission and to which we can contribute uh, exascale computing capabilities to the broader DOE ecosystem. In addition to that, we are focused on co-design centers as well. So co-design efforts are designed to tackle broad computational motifs that are important across a number of different applications. So for example, one of the co-design centers that we're leading here is SEED, and that is focused on high order finite element methods, which are widely used in a number of different applications. So if our team and the team at, um, that we're partnering with at Argonne and Rensselaer and, and other institutions can make those calculations very, very fast on exascale computing architectures, then other applications can leverage that work to make their own applications go even faster. We're also highly involved in particle methods type applications, machine learning, and developing proxy applications for exascale computing applications to understand the performance and workload that we're likely to see on those machines, even before they're delivered. For software technology, we're involved in 14 of 30 different projects, uh, primarily in our math library space, in our user productivity and developers space, so debugging tools, compiler technologies, programming models, 
Uh, we are very active, as I mentioned earlier, in Raja, which is a performance portability tool that we are making broadly available. It was initially developed for the ASC mission and stockpile stewardship, and now we're making that broadly available across, across the Department of Energy. In addition, we have some forward-leaning technologies that we're exploring, such as how can we best leverage in situ compression techniques in the context of a running application to reduce that data movement bottleneck that I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation. And then finally, in hardware and integration, I already mentioned our leadership role in the Path Forward project. Uh, we're responsible for those contracts, but we've also been very active in a team that's been evaluating the architectures that are proposed for exascale class computing and next generation architectures in general using things like memory um, emulators and network emulation. So finally, I'd like to mention that Livermore will be the site for our first exascale computer deployed by the NNSA. That's our El Capitan system, which will be delivered in late 2022 and available for mission uh, work in 2023. The system will have a peak performance of more than one and a half exaflops, which as I mentioned is 10 times more than the Sierra system that we have on the floor today and four times more energy efficient. It will be a Cray HPE system that who will be delivering the system and it will comprise about 4,000 AMD CPU and GPU nodes. We're looking forward to getting this machine in our facility on our machine room floor and as it's essential for meeting the goals for the NNSA life extension programs and for nuclear weapon uh, aging issues. So that's my summary for the Exascale Computing Project and the work that we're doing within the Department of Energy and within uh, Livermore in particular. If you'd like more information, I'd like to invite you to visit our website, exascaleproject.org.